Presidential appointments are subject to congressional approval. The Supreme Court can, as you know, overrule executive orders. And yet the president unilaterally can push what we popularly imagine to be the nuclear button. Encased in a football, carried by a trusted military aide, always at the president's side. Operating within our system of checks and balances, mm -hmm. POTUS possesses unchecked authority to order a nuclear strike. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Falk, President of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, and I'm joined this afternoon with two remarkable guests. Uh, former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, who served in the Clinton administration, and Tom Colina, a nuclear expert. They are the co-authors of a book that I mentioned just a few minutes ago to both of our guests that I had the pleasure of reading uh, two weeks ago when I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and went to Los Alamos just to see what was discussed in the book. The book's title is The Button, The New Nuclear Arms Race in Presidential Power from Truman to Trump. As always, let me remind our viewers that you can purchase a copy of The Button by going to interrobangbooks.com and be sure to type in the code DFWWORLD to get 10% off on your online orders, not just for The Button, but for any book that you might buy. And thank you so much to our friends at interrobangbooks.com. Also want to thank our partner for today's program, uh, the National Defense Industrial Association, also known as NDIA uh, and the Lone Star Chapter. Thank you very much, Mike Dietz and all of the other good friends that are associated with NDIA. Uh, to keep up with our programs, you can go to dfwworld.org. And if you've missed a program, why not go to our YouTube channel, type in DFW World, and you can catch up on all of our past programs. Uh, quick introduction, Dr. Uh, Bill Perry, William Perry, was uh, Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration, but that was just one of the many appointments that he held in government, and of course he was also involved in uh, the private sector. He received the Recip uh, Presidential Medal of, uh, of Freedom, and most interestingly, for, especially for this discussion, he served in the U.S. Army occupation, U.S. Army, and was in Japan during that occupation. He holds a B.S. and M.S. For, in mathematics from Stanford and a doctorate from Penn State. We're joined by Tom Colina, who uh, I mentioned is with the Plowshares Fund, which is a global security foundation. We'll ask Tom to tell us more about it in a few minutes. And he was previously the Director of Global Security at the Union of Concerned Scientists. His degree in international relations is from Cornell University. Thank you, gentlemen. It is very nice to be with both of you. Pleasure to be here. Good so, to be. I always like to start off by getting a sense of where you got your interest in the, in the subject at hand. And uh, Dr. Perry, uh, of course, you were in Japan. I uh, wonder if you might tell us a little bit how that affected you. And then I believe that <clears throat> you were uh, invited to the White House uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So why don't we start with you telling us about those two instances? Yes, I was in the Army of Occupation in Japan, went there immediately after the war was over. And I was just stunned when I walked through the streets of Tokyo. The damage that had been done there by, in this case, conventional bombs. But a year of firebombing had leveled the city. There was not a built, wooden building left standing, and many of the stone buildings were badly damaged. People were in a state of shock. And I reflected as I walked through Tokyo that the damage that had been done in Tokyo took thousands of raids, tens of thousands of bombs over a year's time. Whereas Hiroshima, had received the same devastation, one plane, one bomb, one instant. And I knew immediately, as I thought about that, that the world had been changed forever. We should think of war again as being something that was possible to do. A nuclear war to me, from that point on, has become unthinkable. In 19, <clears throat> at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, in the early 60s, I was called to be, come back and be a, a head of small intelligence team. They would spend every day looking at the data that had been collected that day on Cuba by airplanes, by satellites, intercept systems, 
see if we can determine the status of the nuclear missiles that the Soviet Union was deploying in Cuba. So we'd have a report on President Kennedy's desk the first thing in the morning. He used that report to assess how many more days he had left for diplomacy. His military advisors were all recommending a conventional invasion of Cuba. And had he done that, we now know that would have been followed inevitably by a nuclear general war. Because what he didn't know at the time was that the Soviet Union, besides having the medium range missiles in this Cuba not yet ready, also had tactical nuclear weapons with nuclear warheads and operational ready to go. And so if our troops had actually tried to invade Cuba, they would have been decimated on the beachhead by those nuclear warheads, and that would have led immediately to a, a general nuclear war. So we came very, very close to nuclear war. They're even closer than we realized at the time. At the time, I can remember thinking every day I went in the analysis center, this was going to be my last day on Earth. But it was even more dangerous than I realized, and certainly more dangerous than President Kennedy realized, because we didn't know about those nuclear weapons already in Cuba. Tom, so those, go ahead. So those gave me, those conditioned me to be very, very concerned about nuclear weapons, never to take them for granted, and always to realize that they held over our heads as a threat of ending our civilization. Tom, what is it in, in, in your background, what defining moment made you decide to really take this as, as such a, a, a mission? Thanks, Jim, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with the World Affairs Council uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth. <laughs> Um, my stories can never compare to uh, Dr. Perry, so I'm more you than to go after him. But, um, you know, my experience goes back to when I was in high school. Uh, and in those days, it was the Reagan administration, and it was the end of the Cold War. Uh, and it was the height of the Cold War in many ways. And so there was real fear that the United States and then the Soviet Union uh, would engage in a nuclear conflict, whether intentionally or by accident. So, you know, in those days, these issues felt very topical, uh, very top of the news, very front page in a way that they aren't now, but they were then. Um, and I got involved in this uh, in high school and then in college and then out of college came to Washington and decided that I would uh, try to reduce the risk of nuclear war. And what is the Plowshares Fund? So the Plowshares Fund is a private foundation uh, we focus on nuclear policy issues exclusively. We raise money from uh, private citizens, donors, and give it away to the best uh, people doing the smartest, most effective work. So as I always say, if you uh, have money to give or you have a great idea that needs funding, uh, let us know. We're happy to talk. So... You know, I, I said in my open that people have this vision, this it's almost mythology that some the the football is carried and, and the button is inside the football. Of course, that's not really how it works. Does the president, let's just cut to the chase, does the president have absolute unilateral authority to launch a nuclear weapon? And yes, he does. He can consult with other people. Yeah, that is, he may consult with other people, but he may not. And some of the situations I've been personally most familiar with is when the president got a call in the middle of the night when the attack was underway. He had no opportunity really to consult with other people. He had to make a decision in five or six minutes whether to launch our ICBMs, our missiles, before the Soviet missiles landed. This was, a, this was during the Cold War, before the Soviet missiles landed and destroyed them. So the real danger here was that was associated with the quick launch policies we had that would force the president to make a decision in maybe five or six minutes, a decision so consequential that really all of civilization depended on it. When did this happen? Well, I was when I was the Undersecretary of Defense in the late 70s, I was personally by part of two false alarms, one of which went to the president, one of which didn't. And this is in the late 70s, 
we were very, it was a very tense period of the Cold War. We had every fear that the Soviets were actually planning a surprise attack on the United States. So a false alarm seemed to be very, very credible. And we very nearly, we very nearly launched our weapons in response to a false alarm. We very nearly accidentally started a Cold War, started a nuclear war. So there was a situation with, I guess, Secretary of Defense Lessinger, Henry Kissinger was involved, Brent Scowcroft. They all question President Nixon's judgment, especially near the end of his term. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. And did, did Secretary of Defense Lessinger really have the authority to tell associates that they should not <clears throat> follow an order that came from the president? Is that an accurate statement? <clears throat> this was in the last few months of President Nixon's term, uh, just before he resigned. He was drinking heavily at the time, I mean, really heavily. And Schlesinger was convinced, it was concerned that he might do something rash. And so he called the general of the Strategic Air Command and told him not to take any action on any orders from the president without checking with him. He had no authority to do that, none at all. And it's not, he had no way of knowing whether the general would, would actually honor that request. But that did happen. And it happened because he was very much concerned that this sole authority could lead to a, a war which could end our civilization. So one of the sections of your book that I found very interesting was that President Truman really felt that the responsibility was so important, so critical, that he basically brought the power to launch a nuclear weapon to the president, where before it was held by the military. Tell us more about how that evolved. It's an interesting story, uh, one that I wasn't fully aware of until we, we did the research for the book. Um, but you're right, it was President Truman in 1945 that brought sole authority to the president. Uh, and our assumption was going into it um, that sole authority derived from the need to launch quickly. Uh, but that's actually not the case. Um, in 1945, the United States was the only country that had nuclear weapons. Uh, Russia didn't have them yet. No one else had them yet. So there was no danger at that point of, of a surprise attack of a bolt from the blue. Uh, what Truman was worried about is he saw the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he was so taken aback um, by that destruction that he was very clear that he wanted no one else other than himself making the next decision of whether to launch, to drop a bomb or not. And so he wanted that authority removed from the military and left only with civilian leaders, uh, which is, uh, is as good as far as it goes. The problem is he only gave that authority to one civilian leader himself. Uh, he didn't share that authority with Congress. And the way we would change that policy today would be for the president, the civilian commander in chief, uh, to share nuclear use authority with Congress. Um, now, some people will say, well, you can't do that because that'll slow things down. Our response would be, that's exactly right. We want to slow things down. The danger we see is that a president will make a quick decision, a rash decision, in response to what could be a false alarm. Tom, let me interject and yeah. on this, and let's go back to the devil in the details. How, what, what is the mechanism that President Truman was able to uh, invoke so that the power came to the executive, it came, came to the, the commander in chief? He, and, he, and, and if you change that now, how would you go about doing it? Because clearly I would think a president wouldn't want to give up that power. Well, in, in Truman's case, he just declared it. Uh, he just said, from now on, <laughs> any decision to drop a nuclear weapon must be approved by me personally. Um, this was not approved by Congress. This was not, you know, approved by uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, it was declared by the president. And then it, you know, eventually became U.S. policy. Um, but it was, it, was, it, was a, it was an authority that was taken by the White House, uh, by the president for himself. The way you would change it, uh, and why, and so it's a legitimate question, why would any president give up that authority? Uh, I think the answer is that uh, President Trump today and other presidents like Nixon, who was drinking at his time in office, 
we've had enough examples now to show us that not all presidents are capable of that authority. And I would argue that no president is capable, no person, no human is capable of making a decision uh, on which balances the fate of the earth in just a few minutes. Uh, it's an unnecessary authority and it's a dangerous authority because it leaves just to one person the fate of the world. Uh, and so I would think that uh, the next president, given that we've had so many problematic presidents, Trump, Nixon, others, um, should, for the sake of the country and the globe, change that policy. And the way to do that would be to share that authority with Congress, uh, to say that this would be joint authority, that no nuclear weapons could be used unless uh, the president and Congress concur. Or the, probably the simpler way is to simply say, the United States will never use nuclear weapons first. Uh, and therefore there would be so, no sole authority for first use because there would be no first use. Well, Dr. Perry, you've been around a long time. I mean, we can't even get Congress to you know, renew, pass any type of resolution on what's happening now with the forever wars. I mean, are you really advocating that it be Congress or would it be like the Gang of Eight? I would, I would prefer a, a subsection of Congress and the Gang of Eight would be the most, most reasonable, most logical one to go. The, you may have a difficult time getting a decision from them also, but I would also point out that our Constitution states that only Congress has the authority to declare war. We might not like that, but that's what the Constitution says, that only, con only Congress has it. And certainly the launch of a nuclear weapon against another country is the ultimate declaration of war. So I think <clears throat> as difficult as the problem may be, it's something we ought to face and we ought to do. And of the various ways we might bring Congress into it, I think the most logical way, the way that would be most effective would be to, to have the president confer with the Gang of Eight before he makes the decision. Why do you think, and I'll pose this to both of you, why do you think the American public pays such scant attention to, to this? That's a, that's a psych, question about psychology, I think. Because when I was a, a young man, and when you were a young man, it was during the Cold War, and people did pay attention to it. People believe, and that's because they believed, they believed there was a real probability that the Soviet Union was going to launch a surprise attack against the United States. We really believed that. We had kids taking drills in their classrooms or getting under their desks, you know, other, other silly things like that. But it, it, it illustrated the fact that people really believed that a, an attack from the Soviet Union was quite possible. Nowadays, people don't think of that. When the war, when the Cold War ended, people believed that the danger of nuclear weapons have gone away. And that's just not true. And the fact is, and in my judgment, at least in judgment of many specialists in this field, the danger, the likelihood of a nuclear catastrophe today is actually somewhat greater than it was during the Cold War. Cold War. And yet the public has no sense of this at all. And because the, the book, public doesn't have any sense, then our policies don't reflect that danger. In the book, you shared conversations with some former presidents and how their views had evolved, especially <clears throat> after they left office. I wonder if you might share that with us. Well, one of the conversations uh, that Dr. Perry had was with uh, former President Clinton. Uh, and he was, he was very clear that he, that he think it would be a good idea to have some uh, other input uh, into a president's decision of whether to launch. Because he was very clear that, you know, look, mistakes happen. Um, and the last thing you want is to mis make a mistake about nuclear war. And he also raised the issue of uh, cyber attacks. And this is one of the reasons why we're so concerned about this issue. In fact, we have a whole chapter on cyber attacks in the book uh, because a cyber attack could cause a false alarm. And most people don't realize that our command and control system, our nuclear warning systems are all computer-based, they're all networked, and therefore they're all vulnerable to cyber attack. So just imagine that some entity uh, gets access to the system and somehow manipulates it to show that we are under attack by hundreds of Russian nuclear weapons. Uh, 
Uh, and then the president is told he has four minutes, five minutes to make a decision before those weapons arrive. Uh, that is a terrifying scenario. And in that case, we think it's actually more likely that that attack would be a false alarm than a real attack. And that's the reason why we want presidents to have more time to not feel rushed into a decision uh, because that attack could very well be a false alarm. And I would assume that a cyber attack would not come probably from who we would think would might be our main adversary. Well, certainly if, if our response would be against Russia, you would not expect that cyber attack to come from Russia, right? Because they would be on the losing end. But that's just it. Anyone who wants to create uh, chaos and terror could launch that cyber attack. And just remind our viewers what happened in Hawaii a few years ago. There was a false alarm uh, of an attack, a nuclear attack coming from North Korea to Hawaii. Uh, people in Hawaii thought this was very real. There was widespread panic uh, across the island. And it was uh, some amount of time later that they realized that it was a human error, uh, that someone pushed the wrong button and sent the wrong alert on the warning system. Uh, so it's another example of how mistakes happen, uh, human mistakes happen, machine mistakes happen, false alarms are possible. And we, sh the, you know, the nightmare scenario to us is that we would start a nuclear war in response to a false alarm. And I might add that once the president decides to launch nuclear missiles, they cannot be recalled. Uh, once they're gone, they're gone. That's one of the, what you call myths that people have that you cannot recall them. So one of our members, Steve, uh, writes this, and I'll, I'll read the, the, the whole paragraph and ask you to respond. The problem with no first use is that it literally guarantees our adversaries can strike first with devastating consequences to ourselves as well as our allies. That degrades the whole deterrence concept of not telling your enemy what weapons you will use to deter or stop aggression. How do you respond to that? I would just say that I think that that is a misinterpretation of deterrence. Deterrence is the ability to respond to a nuclear attack. Um, we, could, we could absorb a nuclear attack, God forbid that would ever happen, uh, and still respond. So for example, we have submarines based at sea um, that are invulnerable when deployed under the oceans. So no country could attack the United States, even if we had a no first use policy, which we don't. But no country could attack the United States with nuclear weapons and be confident that they would avoid retaliation. Uh, so deterrence would still hold uh, even in a no first use situation. Dr. Perry, one of the uh, things you said in your book which really struck me was that Japan, for instance, would not be in favor of us putting in place a no first use. Could you elaborate on that? And Tom, I suspect you might have some thoughts as well. Yes, I'm not sure that is true today. But at the time I was the Secretary of Defense, we considered instituting a no first use policy when we were putting our new nuclear policy together. We seriously considered it and we're debating it. And we got representatives from the Japanese government who showed up at our doorstep and urged us not to do it. They were fearful that, that would weaken what is called extended deterrence. That is when we extend our deterrence to Japan and other allies. I don't think that was a correct interpretation, but that's what they believed. And then that input, uh, I think probably swayed the president not to go ahead with instituting no first use policy, but it was the belief that the Japanese had on that was just absolutely without foundation as I could see then and as I believe now. Uh, Don, you have the same question I, I'm really curious about as well. Uh, Don's asks, how do the U.S. limits on launch authority compare to authority in China and the Soviet Union, <laughs> former Soviet yeah. Union? Well, we, we believe that the Russian authority is very similar to the U.S. situation where the president has, in this case, President Putin, has the sole authority to launch. Um, but it's even more dangerous than in the, in the U.S. context because it's our understanding that the Russian early warning systems uh, are less effective. So in other words, President Putin might have even less time to respond if they have a warning of attack. So there is a higher probability of a false launch, a mistaken launch in Russia than here. And of course, if Russia were to launch by mistake, those weapons would likely be coming over here. So it's very much in the U.S. interest to work on this problem uh, of, of false alarms and mistaken launch cooperatively with Russia if we can.
one of the ways we could deal with that would be to have ourselves for the United States a, a no first use policy. And if we had a no first use policy, Russia would have much less reason to believe that we were going to launch a strike against them. But having the policy is one thing. You should also be prepared to take the actions that manifest that policy. Uh, that would involve a reconfiguration of our forces so that they could not be launched quickly. And if we did those things, we would be doing it for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons would be to take the pressure on Russia to reduce the likelihood that they would think an attack was on the way and launch, launch against us. So we would be doing it for our own benefit, not for the Russian benefit. If I could add, Jim, uh, the specific thing we would like to do that we spend quite a bit of time on in the book is to retire uh, U.S. land-based ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, uh, because these are the weapons that are on uh, high alert that would be the most danger of being launched quickly uh, in a false alarm scenario. Um, so they should be retired. We'd be safer for it. Now is the time to have that debate because the Air Force is planning to rebuild the entire fleet of land-based missiles at a cost of over $100 billion. So let's not bear that expense. Let's not spend that taxpayer money if we don't need to, uh, and we don't. And the reason we don't is because we have nuclear weapons on other delivery systems, primarily submarines at sea. And even if we didn't have those weapons, we would still have deterrence. Now go ahead and just sort of briefly explain what the triad means. Sure, so we, we have nuclear weapons deployed on land-based ballistic missiles. Uh, but also submarine-based ballistic missiles and also on uh, bombers, on airplanes. Uh, that is called the triad. Um, and what that means is that, uh, you know, those are uh, redundant in some ways basing modes. And that if we got rid of our land-based ballistic missiles, uh, we could still retaliate with the other two forms of delivery. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, we don't need the ICBMs, and they're, uh, they're more of a danger than they are a benefit. Let me add one point to that, Jim, which is we have many submarines at sea at any one time. One of those submarines, just one of those submarines, has enough destructive firepower that it can completely destroy any country on Earth. One submarine can destroy any country on Earth. That's deterrence. And, that and that's a significant true. change, of course. I mean, the power that we have now and other countries have is just, you know, great, great much greater than Nagasaki or Hiroshima. Or Hiroshima. Yes. Well, to, to make the, the Nag Nagasaki, Nagasaki and Hiroshima was one bomb each, one small bomb each. We have today in our forces of thousands of bombs are 10 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. Beyond that, we have some of our nuclear forces are 100 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. So we have these much more powerful weapons and we have thousands of them. So we have overkill by any stretch of the imagination. Even if we were to go through with the most dramatic arms free reduction that you can imagine, we would still have overkill. So go back to a subject we were talking a few minutes ago, but uh, uh, the Seagulls asked this, and I'd, I'd like Dr. Perry, to, you to reply, especially since you've worked so much of your career in the Pentagon. Can you see a launch order being disobeyed when you look at the chain of command? I cannot imagine the circumstance under which a launch command would be disobeyed. Could happen, conceivable, I can't. I can't conceive of quite the situation which would lead to that. Let's talk about the enormous amount of money that is being spent now on, quote, modernizing our nuclear capability, our nuclear forces. Um, is it needed? And what's the role of the, the, what Truman, of course, famously spoke of, the military industrial complex? So just to lay out the numbers, um, the Trump administration is proposing a more than $1 trillion program over the next 30 years to replace and modernize um, the nuclear arsenal. 
And it's not a question of is it needed or not, it's a question of how much is enough, right? Do we need all of it? And, and our answer is no, um, that we could save a lot of money by, for example, retiring the land-based ballistic missiles, which we've already talked about. Uh, we could save more than $100 billion doing that. Uh, and there are other ways to trim back the modernization program as well. Part of the, but, but we haven't had that debate. I mean, it's kind of shocking to think that the Cold War ended 30 years ago and this modernization program for north of a trillion dollars has been proposed without a full debate about now that the Cold War is over, do we still need the triad? Do we still need all of the weapons that we had uh, in all their different delivery form <clears throat> that we did before? And I think part of the reason we haven't had that debate uh, is for the reason you described. We have a military industrial complex, which is basically defense contractors uh, who make uh, huge amounts of money and there's very many jobs tied up uh, in the production of nuclear weapons. And unless you have- uh, Lots of jobs. Lots of jobs. Unless right you here have, in Dallas, Fort Worth. <laughs> unless you have a political uh, motivation to, to overrule uh, that, that situation, you know, you're going to leave it up to the powers that be, which, which have a profit motive. And that's part of the problem of, you know, now that we don't have the public actively involved in this anymore, it's very hard for politicians and decision makers to overrule the vested interests um, that have sway on these issues. So how obsolete are our nuclear weapons? I mean, are we in a dangerous situation? Uh, one of our listeners, let me try to find his comment. Uh, there we go. Uh, says, I visited an Air Force base that my nephew was stationed. It was in North Dakota. And he got the sense that there were a lot of people who uh, um, had a lot of power. They were standing by watching the red phone for a call. He says, this seems like a very archaic way to launch. Well, I mean, we're not in a dangerous situation, right? I mean, the weapons we have today uh, are fully functional. Uh, they will work if we, if, if we need them to work. Uh, yes, at some point they will outlive their useful lifetimes, right? Uh, at some point bombers have to be rebuilt. At some point submarines have to be rebuilt. They, they all have life expectancies. The question is, do we need to rebuild them all? And in the case of the land-based ballistic missiles, we are saying, no, we don't. Uh, we should let them age out. We should retire them. Uh, we are 30 years past the end of the Cold War. We don't need this capability anymore. In fact, it's dangerous. And we as a country have much higher priorities for that $100 billion, right? Let's address climate change. Let's address racial injustice. Let's find a cure for the pandemic. Uh, let's not sp keep spending money on threats that simply aren't the highest priority threats we face. Again, I, I hear you, Tom, but you, every time the military tries to, redu or, or there's conversation about reducing certain weapon systems or whatever, Congress is mobilized, so many jobs are involved, the defense contractors have lots of lo lobbyists. <clears throat> Again, how do you build the support for such a dramatic change? I think the first thing is educating the public on what the dangers are. But I would also argue that it's, we have a historic example of how that was, when that was done. Because when the Cold War ended, for the first eight years after the Cold War ended, we went through a syst systematic reduction in defense spending and in nuclear spending very significantly. Uh, we would, and this happened, this was completely bipartisan. The first part of that reduction was carried out by the Bush administration, the senior Bush administration, when, as a matter of fact, when Dick Cheney was the Secretary of Defense. And the second part was carried out in the Clinton administration when I was the Secretary of Defense. But we were reducing uh, something like seven or eight percent a year of defense spending for a sustained period of, of eight to ten years before we finally lost heart in doing that and, and started going back to our old habits. But there is a hist historical example when we can actually affect major reductions in defense spending and in nuclear spending. And Jim, I think the secret there is you can't leave it to the bureaucracy to figure this out. It's got to come from above. Uh, the president has to have the right policies and, and has to tell the bureaucracy and the Pentagon uh, what to do. Uh, 
But even that is not enough. We need the public support for those presidential decisions so the president has the political will to get it done. Uh, is there a difference in the policy with uh, candidate uh, Joe Biden versus President Trump? Does the Democratic Party have a platform on this? There, there, there is a very large difference. Um, you know, we are a non, I'm, a, I'm in a nonpartisan organization, but if you look at the policies that we recommend in the book, uh, those policies are much closer to what a Biden administration would do than what a Trump administration would, what would do. What we've seen so far from uh, President Trump is a dismantlement of the arms control regime that we think is necessary to ensure U.S. <clears throat> security. Uh, the president has walked away from the INF Treaty, uh, from the Iran nuclear deal that was freezing and rolling back Iran's nuclear program, uh, and from other agreements, for example, the New START treaty negotiated by President Obama, uh, the Trump administration has so far refused to uh, extend, even though the Russian government is willing to do so. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen the Trump administration uh, expand uh, spending for nuclear weapons. Uh, on the other side of the ledger, um, Vice President Biden, if elected, has said that he would extend the New START treaty, would resume uh, diplomacy with Iran, uh, and would consider um, reallocating defense dollars uh, to higher priority needs. Um, and, and we would hope would entertain such things as slowing down uh, the program for the new land-based ballistic missile. Uh, but we'll have to see. But there's serious differences mm -hmm. between the two candidates. R R remind me the name of the chief arms negotiator. It starts with a B. Um, Billingsley. Billingsley, that's right. So there was a uh, statement just a, a day or two ago that they're really trying to resume discussions and the United States has walked back a little bit on what they were demanding. Is that not accurate? Well, just so. This is an example of why um, uh, I, I'm skeptical of the Trump administration in this case. The Trump, the Trump administration has said that it would extend the New START Treaty if China was part of that agreement uh, and if Russia were to include weapons under New START that are not currently there. The problem with that is that's a new treaty. That's not an extension of New START. That's negotiating a new treaty. You can't get that done by February 2021 when the New START treaty expires. Um, so this, to me, is a joke policy. It's not serious, and it shows that the Trump administration is not really serious or focused on extending mm -hmm. New START in a viable way. Jim, let me point out, though, that this issue should not be a partisan issue and historically has not been. Presidents, uh, since, the, since the days that the Cold War began, presidents of both parties have supported limiting nuclear weapons through treaties. And um, I think most significantly, the most dramatic attempt to reduce nuclear weapons came from President Reagan. Uh, his meeting in Reykjavik with President Gorbachev was the first time any American president actually discussed totally eliminating nuclear weapons. And that was a rock rib Republican president. So d recognizing the nuclear weapons danger and being willing to take actions to reduce that danger <clears throat> is a responsibility of both parties and both parties historically have acted on it. So while we're on the subject of treaties, I want to be sure I get to Ray Termini's question. What are your thoughts on the Nuclear Weapon Ban Treaty, which uh, was passed by the UN General Assembly in 2017? Mm -hmm. It takes at least 50 countries to ratify it, he says, before it comes into effect. So, so in fact, there's, there's about 44 countries that have ratified that agreement so far. So it could come into force later this year uh, or, or next year. Um, we, we support that agreement. Uh, because we think it makes an important point that the world does not support uh, nuclear weapons. The world does not think nuclear weapons are a legitimate way um, of conducting diplomacy. You know, look, we, we have banned chemical weapons. We have banned biological weapons. Uh, nuclear weapons are akin to those weapons in terms of their mass destruction potential. Uh, and I think uh, the way to uh, have those weapons disappear is by other countries making it clear to the nuclear weapons possessor states that these weapons are not acceptable. 
Now, I don't think that we will eliminate nuclear weapons by the weapon states like the United States and Russia signing on to the ban treaty. I think they will do it in a bilateral way um, that reassures themselves. Uh, but I think that the ban treaty, the prohibition treaty is a useful political statement um, that nuclear weapons are not legitimate and that the world does not accept them and the pressure to eliminate them will only build over time. So remind us how many countries now possess nuclear weapons that, or have ad admitted that they have nuclear weapons? There, there are nine. There are nine. The United States, Russia, China, Great Britain, Great Britain, France. Uh, then we have uh, India and Pakistan, and we have Israel and North Korea. And of those nine countries, how many have signed off on or have ratified the uh, non-proliferation treaty, nuclear ban treaty? I mean, well, so so the non-proliferation treaty uh, is is a different treaty, but it's it's signed by the United States, UK. France, uh, Russia, China. Um, the ban treaty, none, none of them have signed on to the ban treaty because no country that want, has nuclear weapons, you know, wants to sign on to a treaty that would make them give them up. So I think, as I said, that's not the path by which countries will get rid of their weapons. But again, it's a useful political statement for the countries that don't have nuclear weapons to say, this is what the world is asking for. Now, one of our uh, viewers, again, Steve, uh, raises this question about China, how China and Russia are really doubling up, spending a lot more money on their military forces, particularly nuclear. And I'm holding an article that was in today's Wall Street Journal with the headline, Pentagon says China could double nuclear weapons in the decade. Uh, um, and uh, says that um, U.S., for example, has 17 hundred nuclear warheads deployed on its long range and shorter range systems, and that Russia has uh, just over 1,500. Um, so uh, should we be more concerned about, about China? I've certainly been, been concerned about China for some time. But to put it in perspective, China has a fraction of the nuclear weapons that we have. Even if they doubled them, they would still have a fraction of the number of nuclear weapons we have. I think the thing we should be looking at is what should our policies be to discourage them from doing that rather than encourage them from doing that. And when we are talking about rebuilding our nuclear forces based on Cold War guidelines, we do nothing to discourage them from, from building up nuclear weapons as well. So the issue is not whether China is a threat to the world of nuclear weapons, the issue is whether we can, by our policies, provide dis no incentive to them to increase their nuclear, nuclear weapons and build, them, and build them up. Jim, just to add to that, one of the concerns that the Pentagon called out in that report was that China might be moving towards a quick launch policy uh, like the United States has, and that that's a danger to the United States. And that would be true if, if, if that's actually what's happening. But instead of just talking about it or, or building up our forces to respond to it, we could do what China is doing, which China has a no first use policy. Uh, and that policy is backed up by the fact that they don't put their warheads on their missiles in peacetime. So it's a, it's a real no first use policy. And we could do the same thing. And that would go a long way towards reducing a danger of a Chinese quick launch policy. Um, another question from Don. Uh, it seems to me on, the, on this, we have a few people who are asking a lot of questions, and I'm sorry I can't get to all of yours, Steve, but I appreciate your, your, your comments. And we do have a few more minutes, so keep on sending in your questions. But Don asked about space, and I know that President Trump has created the Space Force. I'd like to know uh, from both of you what your thoughts are on that. And, and as Don says, do you envision the U.S. placing nuclear weapons in orbit so they can be dropped on our enemies especially, he adds, if ground-based missile silos are eliminated. N nuclear weapons in space are a very bad idea for a lot of reasons, but let's just start off with the reason for national, from a national interest point of view. We have a tremendous dependence in our country on our satellite systems, both militarily and in the, in the commercial end, for communication systems, for navigation systems. Our GPS is based on satellite. So we have a huge stake and maintaining a safe system in space. 
we have a huge stake in not seeing any military conflict take place in space. So any move in that direction is bad news for us, and we ought not to be the one to be stimulating that move. Tom, Tom do you want to add to that? You know, just, just, you know, we don't want to encourage any asymmetric approaches to our security, right? We don't want to promote countries going after our greatest vulnerabilities. And our greatest vulnerability is one of our greatest vulnerabilities is our dependence on space and satellites in space. And so as, as Dr. Perry said, we just shouldn't be doing anything in space that increases the danger to our own assets there. What type of discussions and negotiations are going on about this subject? Well, luckily so far, uh, putting nuclear weapons in space has not been part of the Trump administration's space force. Uh, and, and I hope it stays that way. So at this point, I, I don't see anybody proposing nuclear weapons in space. Um, and, uh, and that's a good thing. Albert Plunkett, uh, Dr. Perry asks, could you speak to the incident when Bill Clinton lost the launch codes, codes refused to admit it, and what other officials did to address this? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the incident happened. I did not, cannot really add to the details out that. I will say that it Were happened. Were you Secretary of Defense at the time? I was Secretary of Defense at the time, but I have to say that neither he nor I at that time in history, 1995, 1996, believed that the nuclear war, war, war was even thinkable. Oh, we had no, we were allies with Russia at that time almost. We had Russian forces, uh, a brigade of Russian forces embedded in an American division in Bosnia at that time. I mean, we were working arm and arm. It was unthinkable, really, that there would be a nuclear uh, or any kind of a war with Russia, particularly a nuclear war. So it was the last thing on anybody's mind at that point. So I, in Bill Clinton's defense, I would say, if any time in history, the president could be casual about the, the nuclear launch shows, it was probably that year. It's so, just, a, just a point to add, Jim, it's interesting that, that for, for President Clinton, uh, him having the uh, sole authority and the football to him was not so much about uh, a quick launch against Russia, because as Dr. Perry said, that wasn't something that he was seriously considering. He saw it as a symbol of civilian control of nuclear weapons, as a reassurance to Russia that the military doesn't have this football, only the president has this football. And that's just an interesting way to look at it. Uh, we look at it at that way too. It is a, it is a reassuring uh, sense of civilian control. But again, we just question why it has to be one civilian. Why can't it be um, mm -hmm. more than one civilian? It was during the Clinton presidency. The, the Russia had a false alarm. They had a, a rocket run off in the Brent Sea area that looked like it might be a Trident missile coming in Moscow. And so Russia went into a false alarm alert and it got <clears throat> to, to uh, Yeltsin, President Yeltsin. He is reputed to have said, Oh, that's silly. This would not be American launch. Bill Clinton would never launch a missile to me. He's a friend of ours. So, well, that's an, that story is kind of silly in a way. It does, it is under, the underlying fact is that Clinton and Yeltsin were very close to each other. Our two countries were very close to each other. It would be like this. We heard that the United Kingdom had launched a missile. Do we worry about the United Kingdom launching a missile at us or France launching a missile at us? We were almost in that category with Russia at that time. Unfortunately, that has changed since then. But for that short period of time, that brief period in history, and the military attack from Russia really was quite unthinkable. Give us a sense, and this is again from, our, from one of our viewers, of how much time we in the United States have if there was an attack. And, and clearly it depends whether it was directed towards Hawaii or San Diego or Dallas or Washington. But how much time do we have if a missile were, were to be launched from, from, Russia's, from, from Russia? Well, if a missile was launched from Russia, it would land in the United States in less than half an hour. And the question of how much time we have is how much time to do what? And there's no way we can stop the missile. Our defense systems are not capable of dealing with a, any, any kind of concerted attack from Russia. Uh, so they're going to land, they're going to, they're going to do some, some substantial damage. Uh, 
Uh, so we would have some kind of response. When do we have to have that response? We do not need to have it five minutes or 10 minutes or an hour. We have time to think about what we want to do. And the last thing we want to do is act before the missile lands, because in that case, we may be launching, we may be launching falsely. We may be launching on the basis of a false indication. The worst thing in the world that could happen would be for us to start a nuclear war by accident. And that's exactly what would happen if we launched on the basis of a warning which turned out to be false. And I tell you, I don't take false alarm as a theoretical problem. <clears throat> I lived through two of them when I was the Under Secretary of Defense during the Cold War. And on one of them, I was actually awoken at night at three o'clock in the morning by the watch officer of North American Air Defense Command telling me that his computers were showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. He quickly went on to explain that he concluded his computers were er in error. And he was calling me to see if I could help him figure out what had gone wrong with his computers. But before he called me and before he knew it was a false alarm, he had also called the White House and alerted him that. But before Brzezinski could wake up the president to tell him that, he got a second phone call telling him it was a false alarm. That's how close we were, that was minutes away. Mm. So in your book, you also really talk about some of the arguments and discussions among military officials about whether or not a nuclear war or a nuclear strike, nuclear altercation is ever winnable. Talk with us a little bit about who thinks, who has thought that you could have lim a, a limited nuclear strike. I would start off by saying that both President Reagan and President Gorbachev said a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. And that, that I believe, and that should be our policy today, and that's the policy which our president should be stating today. Tom, what do you have to add to that? Well, just on the issue of limited nuclear war, um, President Trump deployed a, a low-yield nuclear weapon on Trident submarines. Uh, in, in the rationale being uh, that we could use this weapon potentially in a limited war scenario, that if uh, Russia were to use low-yield nuclear weapons against the United States, we could respond with a low-yield nuclear weapon and that we could, we could limit nuclear war in that fashion. Um, I think that's a, a fantasy. I think it's a dangerous fantasy. It's a theory that has never been tested, thank goodness. Um, but I think there's no reason to believe that once nuclear weapons start flying, uh, high yield or low yield, that you could expect that that mm. would not escalate into full-scale nuclear war. I agree with Tom. I'd only add to that, that the term low yield is a little confusing, I think. Um, a low yield weapon might be the equivalent of a uh, hundred of our biggest conventional bombs. I mean, a low yield weapon is, it could be a, a, a third or a fourth the size of the Hiroshima bomb. So we're talking about hugely destructive forces. And to think that you could use that force and it wouldn't escalate up to the next level is ex exceedingly delusional. So give us a sense of how much damage that would do if it landed in New York City. Oh, just a guess. It might kill 50, 100,000 people. So I suspect, uh, Dr. Perry, you were, have been involved and consulted on negotiations with North Korea. Is there any, do you see any way that North Korea would abandon its nuclear capability? <clears throat> um, no, is the short answer. <clears throat> the longer answer is they use the nuclear weapons <clears throat> as a deterrence, as a deterrence to the United States from overthrowing the regime. <clears throat> and I think that's not a completely unrealistic consideration that, they're, uh, that they have. But in any event, they were fearful that we would use military force to overthrow the regime. And they saw the nuclear weapons as a way of deterring us from doing that, which of course it, 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 it will, it would. Um, but they are not stupid and they're not suicidal. So they're not going to use them in a first strike anywhere because they know that that would lead to the immediate destruction of their country and their regime. So I'm not happy about the North Korean nuclear weapons. I spent a good part of my life trying to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. But now that I have them, I'm also not deeply concerned about them. I do not think that they will use them in a 
first strike provocative way because they are not suicidal. You feel the same way about Iran? About? Iran? Yes, I do. That Just, Iran is not suicidal and would not use nuclear I do, but I think it's much more theoretical in the case of Iran because I don't believe Iran will ever get to a nuclear weapon. The question is whether they will be stopped from getting their nuclear weapon by agreements and treaties such as we have right now, or whether they will stop by Israel attacking them. And if they get very close to a nuclear bomb, I think it's quite likely that they would be attacked by Israel to stop that from happening. And that would lead to probably a much greater and extensive Mideast war that could turn nuclear. So I'm very concerned about the Iran nuclear bomb, but not for the reason that I think they would get one. I don't want to let you go without telling us about a time when you thought about resigning as Secretary of Defense, and that was over the expansion of NATO. <clears throat> um, when the President decided to expand NATO, first with the three or four members and then ultimately quite a few more, I was working very closely with the Russian Minister of Defense and Minister of State at the time. And I knew exactly what their reaction was going to be to that. We were very close. We had a very close relationship, a very close partnership with Russia at that time, including their having troops embedded in the American division in Bosnia. We were close to becoming allies and close to ending the hostility, completely ending the hostilities that built up during the Cold War. And I was fearful that this, and I knew how much opposed they were to NATO expansion because they felt it threatened them. And so I was opposed to doing that for fear it would break off that relationship and lead us on a downward path to hostility arising again between the United States and Russia, which indeed is what happened, not just because of the expansion of NATO, but the expansion of NATO was the first step down that, the first slide down that slippery slope. So I wanted to stop that. And I argued strongly the president, so strong that he agreed to call a cabinet meeting for me to make my point, which I did. And I thanked the president for giving me that opportunity, but I lost the argument. And after losing it, I was, was almost was ready to become a hard loser. I was ready to resign and protest because I thought it was gonna be catastrophic for the country over the long term. It has turned out to be even more catastrophic than I believed at the time, because in fact, it has the first step in leading to a new Cold War. Having lived through one Cold War, the last thing I want to do is see our country have to live through another Cold War, but that's what we are doing right now. And that NATO expansion was the first step that moved us in that direction. So we have just another minute. Um, who carries the football? So there's a military aide uh, that rotates between the services that carries the football 24-7, uh, 365, and is never uh, very far from the president. So if the president ever uh, feels the need uh, to launch, then the ability is there. And you're seeing right now uh, photographs uh, that have shown up uh, because uh, when the president, wherever the president is, uh, the football is not far behind. So if you look close enough, you'll find it. Hmm. Well, gentlemen, uh, Dr. Perry, Tom, I want to thank you both for being with us. Um, I read the book, as I said, a few weeks ago, and there's just so many parts that I found interesting that I had not seen elsewhere. I, I thank you for writing it. I want to encourage our viewers to, to pick up a copy of The Button. I hope you do it through Dallas's independent bookstore in terabangbooks.com. Take advantage of that 10% discount. I hope you'll help us keep the conversation going by texting uh, DFW World to 44321. If you know a member or you know someone who is not yet a member, tell them about our World Affairs Council. If you are a member of a World Affairs Council elsewhere in the United States, all of you can be great ambassadors for your local council and I hope you will be. Again, thanks so much for being with us, Dr. Perry and Tom Colina. Have a great thank evening. Thank you, thank you, Jim. And Jim, let me just add one other point. Besides yes, recommending reading the book, I would recommend that any, any of your members get a hold of, go to the web and get our podcast. We just released a podcast a few weeks ago. It's called At The Brink. Great. And you can go to atthebrink.org and get it. And it's free and you can uh, read it at your leisure. I look, forward, I look forward to listening to it.